Welcome to Queer Talk, the number one podcast to connect you to all of your favorite queer creators and a space where we can share our stories on all things queer related. My name is Brie Walker at Brie Logan on all platforms. Um, and this episode, we're going to be tackling a bunch of topics. So with that being said, um, our guest on this week's podcast, um, they are a photographer, a playwright, a TikTok creator, and the leader of the queer apocalyptic commune. You can find them on TikTok at Eli underscore Photog, P-H-O-T-O-G. Please welcome Eli Campbell. Hey. Hey, hey, hey. We appreciate you being on here. You're our very first guest being recorded on the podcast. I'm honored. Awesome, as always. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. I don't know why I say we, like I have a whole team behind me. It's literally just me. It's and okay. My Theoretically, house. it's a whole team. <laughs> Theoretically, I'd love it to be a whole a whole team at some point. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, so I want to get to this queer vision for the apocalypse. But let's yeah. begin with TikTok. Um, you know, we kind of started this all because of this. And so I kind of want to know, like, how did you come across TikTok and start making videos? Yeah. To be honest, I am notorious in my friend group for being really bad at social media, like like laughably bad and um and the internet in general. So a few of my friends had told me to get TikTok for a while, like not to make videos, just to have it and consume content. And I kept refusing because I was like, that's just another social media platform that I'm not gonna be able to figure out. And then quarantine happened. <laughs> And I had so much free time. And so finally, like nail in the coffin, uh, one of my friends was like, Eli, you have to get TikTok. There are so many videos of dogs on there. And I was like, okay. Um, And I downloaded it and I didn't start making videos for a while, but I, um, I originally started like exclusively to create photography content. um, And it's kind of transformed you know, things got gay, so. (laughs) Things got gay really quick. (laughs) Real quick. (laughs) So you started for the dogs, so do you still see dog content, or is it all gay content? Oh, listen, I do see, I do see dog content, less than when I originally started, because I think the algorithm is, like, confused about what I want to (laughs) see, but I, I do see dog content, and it's a highlight of my day, for sure. So would you consider yourself more of a dog person or a cat person? I'm astoundingly a dog person. Astoundingly dogs. Okay. Yeah. I love cats. I do. I have, my family has a cat, but, um, I'm so invested in having a dog. (laughs) That's awesome. Do you have any dogs right now? I don't. I had a dog growing up, um, and I'm actually in the process of adopting a dog. I don't have like a specific dog that I'm adopting but I'm like in the works of of going to shelters and finding one very excited for it It feels like that's like the mark of my adulthood like I'm finally an adult because I can financially support a dog you know (laughs) yeah no I totally I totally understand that I don't have a dog either but I want to get pigs like I want to get two Pigs. pigs yes like teacup pigs or just like yeah I mean technically they're not teacups they like they're just regular pigs but they're just small when they're babies. I guess it's just like a common myth, but like they get up to like 70 to a hundred pounds. And so I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to need a house. So it's going to sure. take a couple years. I'm going to need a big yard if I'm going right. to do it right. I'm, I can't just have one because they need a companion. So I'm going to have to get two. <laughs> Makes sense. And then I need a bigger car to, to put them in in case they get sick or I like want to take them to the park or something. So like the, it's a park. It's Can a you imagine? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> take them the park. to the park. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be amazing. But, and, and I'm, I mean, I'm only, I'm glad you thought it out. Yeah. I, I'm only two years older. I think you're 23, right? Yeah. I am. Yeah. And I still feel like that it's like a, it's a big, it's a big undertaking to have well, your own pet. It is a big undertaking to have your own pet, and I do think you have to have a certain level of financial security in order to do it, but what I think what you're talking about is, like, next level. <laughs> like, here's me with <laughs> trying to adopt a dog, and, like, you're up here. 
Yeah, I think I'm either gonna go hard or go home. Like if I'm gonna do it, Love I'm it. gonna I'm gonna fucking do it. Like I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna go really hard. I'm gonna do the Instagram accounts. Like it's gonna be a thing. Maybe um, even I can't wait. <laughs> I I need we'll you see. to tag me real quick. I know. I I will. I completely will. <laughs> um, but yeah, back to uh, TikTok. Um, Mm -hmm. so you got on and then you started making content. Did you start making photography content first or did you like see, like finally get into gay TikTok and was like, oh shit, like I need to start doing this. I did get into gay TikTok first. Okay. It was just a natural process given how gay I am. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, and so it, yeah, it, those videos came up for sure beforehand, but I, um, I don't know why in my brain I was like, but you're not participating in that. <laughs> like you're participating over here in this other section. Um, and I really just wanted to like make videos about the kind of behind the scenes of photography maybe for like super mm-hmm. beginner photographers because I learned photography from the internet so I'm a big believer in like self-teaching and that sort of thing and um I really wanted to make content that was sort of like comedic and entertaining but also informational um and then I just uh, uh got gay as I said before <laughs> <laughs> well I think you nailed it I mean not I would say I'm a photography beginner. Like I have a nice camera and I try to do the whole thing because I had done some traveling and I was like, I'm going to get a nice camera. And yeah. And like your, like your videos are super informative. They're funny. Like it's cool as fuck to see like the settings and the different moods that you're creating. And I don't even know if I can do it. Cause like just thinking about like Adobe Photoshop makes my head explode. It just seems like this insurmountable, like, obstacle that just, like, I'd rather just hit, like, auto on, like, my iPhone and just, like, (laughs) just let it go. Oh, I get it. Photoshop still scares me. It's, she's mammoth. Like, that (laughs) software, she's just, (laughs) you know, she's that mysterious girl that you fall in love with. (laughs) You're constantly trying to figure it out if she still likes you or not. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I actually mostly use Lightroom for the vast majority of my editing, which is a much simpler program, but, um, I'm some, actually something that I've been enjoying about making these videos is like challenging myself to learn new things in Photoshop. And, um, I don't know, for some of them, like the whole idea for the photo shoot was just like, oh, this is something in Photoshop that I don't know how to do. So I'm going to learn how to do it. And then I'm going to try it out. And, and that was fun. Yeah. You, I could definitely see that you had fun with it and just like I don't know like I think it's really cool like the different moods that you created and the different angles and I had no idea that you could do rain like you could literally just put rain in like just be like oh it's it's a sunny day but we're gonna make it rainy <laughs> that was one of the things that I really wanted to learn how to do I because I think one of the things that Photoshop is known for that I am not good at is like um, like adding things in not just rain but just like physically altering photos whereas the editing that I'm used to is more just like tonal shifts and like oh mm-hmm. we're gonna make this more vibrant I don't know <laughs> um, so that was that was a skill that I was excited to learn and it it was fun an interesting process for sure that's awesome and I feel like there's some time just with quarantine to be able to do that. I mean, I know that you talk about, but because it is, it, it does suck being furloughed and, and things like that. And you had talked about that, but it, I feel like there is some, some good to being in quarantine because it, it can make you more creative because you have some time to be able to do the things that you wouldn't have normally done. Yeah, definitely. I, when quarantine first started, I went through a period of time that I think a lot of people went through, especially artists and other creative people, where it was sort of like, suddenly you had all this time to do all the stuff that you always said you would do if you had time, but also there was a global pandemic going on, and everyone was very stressed and sad, um, which I think was really hard to come to terms with 
like within your brain. So I had a period of time that probably lasted like a month where I really had no motivation to write or do photography, do anything. Um, and I got really down on myself um, because of it. And honestly, like starting making videos kind of pulled me out of that, which was cool. That's awesome. Um, yeah. I do remember you making a video about that. And I related to that specific thing so hard because um, I always grew up with the mentality of like, if you're not doing anything, like you're not being productive and being productive is how you achieve worth. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> and so having all of this time to, you know, you can allocate it to so many different pursuits now. And if you're not doing anything and there's, you know, like what, then who are you? What are you doing? Like, wow. Right. How is your worth? So I got down on myself too about that because I'm like, well, I have nothing fucking better to do, but I can't seem to do anything today. And now I feel like a piece of shit because I have all this time and I'm not using quarantine properly, you know? Right. But also, I mean, it was so unprecedented. Like there's no way that like time in quarantine and time under the like stress and, and international trauma of like what we all experienced is not the same as having a staycation like it's just not right. and I think that was really difficult for people including myself to wrap our heads around and that's just growing up in a capitalist country I think <laughs> yeah I totally I totally agree with you I because I felt like the first three weeks I was so excited because I was so over scheduled and I was saying yes to everything and had a, started a new job and had all of these extracurriculars lined up. And, mm -hmm. and then having that time, I was like, Oh my God, I can, I can try this. I can try this. I have this, like I have so much time. And then after those three weeks, I was like, okay, I'm over this. I need to socialize. I'm not socializing. Like loneliness is kicking in. Mm -hmm. And now I don't want to do any of the things that I was previously doing that I was so excited about doing. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I can definitely agree with you on that. And that's when I started TikTok as well, was that really? kind of time because I was like, wasn't sleeping. And I kept feeling like, I don't know if you had this, but I kept feeling like I was hitting the pillow and it just happened. Like I had just, I just laid down and that's all I, all I did. Like, I feel like that was the only thing I did <laughs> during the day, yeah. was just lay down to go to bed. And then I get up and lay down to go to bed again. Definitely. Totally. Because it's um, just such a shock mm -hmm. to your system to have such a change in schedule. Yeah. So I think the moral of the story is to not be like hard on yourself and to try not to view your worth in your productivity. One second, sorry. Yes. Oh, totally fine. <laughs> no, I'm good. Thank you. We're living with our parents. <laughs> this is what we yeah, have to deal with. <laughs> the joys of quarantine <laughs> I told my parents because they were they went to work out and they're like we're coming back do you want Chick-fil-a and I was like oh I have a bone to pick with Chick-fil-a but get me some grilled nuggets <laughs> leave them leave them in the fridge I got a podcast <laughs> I got a freaking host <laughs> that's amazing that's amazing <laughs> It's always hard with Chick-fil-A. And not that I'm a huge Chick-fil-A person, but like if right. people are going to go get it, I'm not going to be like, no, I'm not going to go. I you know, it. it's, it's hard. <clears throat> Fries kind of rock my world. So they do. I, I feel like I'm outing myself right now as someone who eats Chick-fil-A. <laughs> it's hard. I feel like so many gays like Chick-fil-A though. And like, I feel like a lot of them have worked there because they had Christian backgrounds, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah. So yeah. That. But yeah, so TikTok, when you started making content, so you had, I forget which video went viral, um, but you had a video take off and then it kind of started catapulting you into kind of growing a, like a following. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Like when you had that first video and like when you were like, holy shit, like <laughs> this could be a thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think. Um the video that you might be talking about is um, just like a little skit that I made about like uh, compulsory heterosexuality. <laughs> yes, it is that one. You're right. Completely. Yeah. Yeah. That was really the first one that 
kind of got big and I um it was really strange at first because I was not it wasn't like I I made that video and as I was posting I was like oh, this is this is it guys like <laughs> this will catapult this is, me into queer fame everybody right um but it did it was it did end up being pretty important to me just because I realized that this thing that honestly I have um I'm not sure if struggled with is the right term but really kind of like got stuck in my head this thought process of like can you really be gay if like you've had feelings for men and have you've had all these complicated ideas around um, heterosexuality and bisexuality and whatever uh, that's really like been lodged in my head for a long time and it's something that I have even within the past few years really just like come out on the other side of and so um, you know I thought I was just making like what might be a casually relatable video but the amount of comments that I got of people saying like I really needed to hear this and and like I had never thought about it this way and I feel like I need to sit down and think about this and really evaluate like <laughs> what's going on in my head it was just really powerful to me and um honestly like taught me a lot about how the world is and how queer people right now are experiencing their own brains, which was really exciting to me. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I remember, and now I remember that video. It, I went through all of your videos last night and I had already gone through them because I had been like watching your videos for a while. And um, compulsory heterosexuality is some other shit. And it's something that like, it's really hard to think of it is an abstract kind of um an idea and like it's something where you're indoctrinated with all of these heteronormative beliefs and I feel like it's kind of like a like a boat and then you're that's you know has filled with water and you're having to constantly scoop all of this shit out of your brain yeah. that you don't fucking need and totally. but you need to realize that it's there in the first place so like the first thing is to realize oh my god like do I really have to shave my armpits? Is that, that, that's something I've been going through right now is like, do I really need to do this? Like, do I have yeah. to do this? Do I want to do this? Who's telling me I need to do this? Am I doing it for myself? I, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> that good. was unexpected. <laughs> We're going to put that back up there. I have this literally resting on two little yoga, like purple things. Oh, incredible. Obviously, it's not working. You're currently on um, an anthology of Shakespeare and a game of Scrabble. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Um, here. I hope this won't fall again. We'll see. We were getting into a really good conversation, too. <laughs> They're out to get us. This is homophobic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're good. Okay. Sweet. But yeah, so I've, like... I didn't even realize compulsory heterosexuality was a thing until probably about six months ago. And sure. it, once I realized the term, cause I didn't know the terminology behind it. I just knew that like I'd been battling gender normative behavior for literally my whole life. And then when I came out, I started really digging into like these gender roles and how arbitrary they are. And like, and I literally got to a point where I had come out I was in my first relationship and I watched this, uh, I think it was The Gender Revolution on Netflix. I think that's what it was called. And I cut off all of the bows on my underwear. Wow. That's amazing. I was, I was like, why is there bows on my underwear? This is ridiculous. There's bows on all women's underwear. Like that's stupid. Who wears fucking bows anymore? You know, like besides Jojo Siwa, so like <laughs> I, I literally went crazy. It was like easy A and she was like putting all the stuff together and she was like all kinds of crazy. I was literally yeah. that fucking girl and I was like, cutting fucking bows off of everything because I, I thought it was the dumbest was shit first, ever. Like revolutionary act against gender norms. I love that. That's amazing. Yeah. So yeah. have you had anything like that? Like, have you 
had anything recent or anything where you were just like, what the fuck? Why am I doing this? This is ridiculous. Hmm. That's a good question. Well, I think, I think a lot of that is sort of like parallel and also interacting with my uh, gender experience um, and like realizing that I am not a woman. <laughs> um, but I, I think that it's been more so than your story of like suddenly just being like, what the fuck is this? I think it was more gradual and just a lot of little things that that came together probably. Because um, I, I mean, specifically with sexuality, like I, I remember as a pretty young teen being like, like hearing all of these narratives about people who always knew they were gay, like mm -hmm. from a very young age, they were like, yeah, I mean, I've always known, but I was just like keeping it hidden because I knew that it wasn't acceptable. And I just so did not identify with that. And so hearing that over and over from people and then uh, not having had that same experience really made me like question whether or not I was making it all up. <laughs> and um, yeah. And so I think that has been like the longest and slowest, but also the most important like journey or process of um, discovery, I guess. Yeah. I like that. Um, I definitely felt the same way. I didn't know either. Like it was, and it was like a good 10 year probably process of figuring mm -hmm. it out. Um, from seeing, and I am one of those people that Kara Knightley, she was the one who fucking outed me when I was 14 in Pirates of the Caribbean. I don't know why it was her. Apparently it's her for a lot of people. And it was for me when I was 14 and I was watching and it, it was really crazy because it, it was a really unfeminist scene. It was a really, not a good scene for women. It was when she was so like the corset was so tight that she like couldn't breathe. <laughs> sure, I getcha. <laughs> and I was, I was like, oh wow, she looks, good. she looks really good in that. And then I was like, oh no, why do I think she looks good? I thought Orlando, Orlando Bloom, I thought doesn't he look good too? I was like, I don't know. And then she just passed out and flipped over the edge, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> No, that's, it's real. I don't know what it is about her. Maybe it's her, her bone stretcher is like out of this world. It is. It really so is. So I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's something as simple as that. But like, I, I mean, I made a video about it, but I think it's actually very funny that like me as this young seven-year-old was like, I really, I really like this character because she's like, she's, <laughs> dressed as a, a boy but yeah. it's like renaissance England so dressing as a boy doesn't really mean anything like she still had a very feminine yeah. haircut and was like she was just a beautiful woman but like in my mind I was like she's dressed as a boy so I it makes sense that I like her like yeah. it, you're allowed but, you're allowed to like her because she looks exactly like a boy like but that makes sense and now I look back on it I'm like damn you gay little asshole you little homo <laughs> so when it comes to your coming out story you know how when did you kind of start to realize that you know you were gay and then when in that turning point did you start to you know question your gender and come out as non-binary I started questioning my sexuality when I was 14. Um, I have a very sweet little story that feels like it should be in a like gay coming of age movie of just like having a really close friend and then like realizing that maybe I liked her as more than a friend and then both of us kind of like figuring that out together and it was very sweet. Um, but but then that was followed with a lot of the stuff that we've already talked about like just really questioning myself I remember this this makes me so sad to think about but I remember like not I, like 
really believing for a while that I was in the same sort of relationship as like my friends who are in relationships with men like it just didn't seem like it was as important or mm-hmm. valid or whatever um, and that caused a lot of stress on my little 14 year old brain and then like as I transitioned into high school because that was the turning point from eighth grade to high school. Um, It just felt like such a huge change. And I had so many anxieties about being in this new school and like trying to be accepted and whatever. And so that kind of um, ended that relationship for me because I was so scared. Um, And I had outside influences telling me that like, people wouldn't like me if they found out in high school that I liked girls. Um, And so I, I didn't really like shut that down consciously. um, But it it definitely kind of took a a backseat in my life for a while in high school as I was trying to figure out other parts of my personality and like become a person (laughs) the way that you do when you're growing up. and and while I was in high school, I identified, I went through a few different labels as I was trying to search for, for the right one, um, but mostly identified as like pan and bi mm-hmm. um, until I got to college. And then I, uh, I would say like maybe the end of my freshman year of college, I, um, I kind of just had this realization that was like kind of picking apart the feelings that I was having for men in my life and um, realizing that I can still like like men and want to be around them and want to be friends with them and that that often in my mind is taking up the same space as like a romantic crush Um, but that it just doesn't it doesn't feel the same uh, for me so so that was when I really started to accept that and just started calling myself gay. And now I'm kind of less hung up on the exact nuance of my sexuality. And I still Uh just call myself gay and let that be whatever it is now. Um, But, and then I, I mean, I was, I was never like really trying to hide that from people, but as far as coming out, um, I think that I was like fully and completely out by my sophomore year of college um, that's when I told my parents and, and they were kind of <laughs> the last to know. Um, but, but then as far as gender, um, that's another one that took quite a long time to, to come to terms with. And I actually only just really like came out with it, um, this past year. And, uh, but, but I would say that I started really questioning that my freshman year of college as well okay yeah that's amazing that's awesome it's it's something that takes so like long especially if you you have other things at play right so you have your sexuality and then that's you also have gender which is something completely separate and so Mm -hmm. you were you know tackling the sexuality piece but you're also doing these other things that typical teenagers do when they grow up which is figuring out who they are their autonomy they you you know we want to fit in like so badly when Mm -hmm. we're in junior high and high school and so like you were talking about people that were saying like oh like people won't like you if you come out and doing all this so then you're like Mm -hmm. shit I want to I want to be liked by my peers and you know I want to have that but then there's this other thing I'm not really being true to myself which one do I pick you know and yeah. I feel like undoubtedly a lot of us pick the one that will have the, you know, least amount of impact on how people view us, you know, totally. and those ex the external stuff. And then all of the things that we want on the inside get kind of shoved down because we're not going to put that above other people's opinions and what they think because right. we're young and our brains aren't even fully developed. And yeah it's it's freaking rough and oh it just it hurts it hurts when I hear about those things but it's also feels you know a little bit good because we're all in the same boat for the most part 
Like we all have those kind of stories. I think that's why so, so many queer people like bond over, and this is terrible that they bond over this, but binding over emotional baggage, trauma, anxiety, and depression. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> like those are like um, things that like you just put in your bio and be like, oh yeah, I fuck with that. Let's, I get let's it. go yeah. that. You got social yeah. anxiety? Oh, me too. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is deeply comforting to know other people that have experienced similar things as you and who understand the exact like nuances of the decisions you've had to make and the the journeys that you've been on I guess um and not to say like I am glad other people have that emotional trauma but like it definitely is something that I think brings us all together in a way that other well I was going to say in a, in a way that other communities might not understand but I don't I think there's a lot of communities that have shared yeah. trauma <laughs> A lot of minority communities have shared trauma, just different kinds of trauma, but it's all under the same veil yeah. of like oppression. <laughs> right, right. Um, but, but then it makes it all the sweeter when we come out on the other side. Yeah, because I feel like you work so hard to get to that point. So it's kind of relishing in like, I remember when I was down here, now I'm up here and kind Definitely. of looking back on that and then giving back. And that was... I, you know, you can maybe attest to this too, but it was kind of one of the things that, where I never thought I'd be able to be making videos. Hell, I never thought I'd be able to do a podcast talking about stuff like this because I was had so much internalized homophobia and I was just happy that I had come out and I was dating. And But I always wanted to do something like this. I just never thought I could. I mean, this was like just a year ago. I was like, I'd love to do this. I just, I couldn't see myself doing it. I don't have the confidence to do it. I still working through my own stuff to be able to get there. And it didn't really occur to me. I had been working this job. And then when I got on TikTok and I had my first video blow up, I was like, holy shit. Like, I think I can do this. I'm, I've, I feel empowered enough in this space in TikTok. And there's so many cool people doing so many different things, like all of these queer people and showing off their talents and just their queerness and being so confident about it. And I was just like, oh my God, like, this is it. Like I, yeah. it gave me that boost that I needed to do what I really wanted to do and to give back to the community that's helped me. Cause like we've all done, I'm sure you have your favorite creators like on YouTube and different platforms and like to be able to like do what they did for me feels so fucking good. Definitely. Absolutely. And I think there's such a huge part of that feeling that's just like the rampant imposter syndrome <laughs> of, uh -huh. like feeling like you can't ever be like enough of an expert have enough of a like meaningful experience to share with people but ultimately it's um I I think that people just want to hear about other people who are going through similar things as them and that's all you need. I I experienced that so much with um, specifically talking about being non-binary because I'm I just came out relatively recently, um, and I'm still very much figuring it out. And and I have not studied gender theory. Like there's so much yeah. about it that I feel like I need to be an expert on so that I can um, like educate people. But I don't I don't think people want to be educated. I think they just want to like hang out with you virtually <laughs> and, yeah <laughs> and know what you're going through because they're probably going through something similar and that's something that I've really learned from TikTok particularly I think you're right I think that it's education through entertainment you know mm -hmm. like education through funny videos through like just having stories where mm -hmm. people if you're talking about those type of things and like I, I know you had a TikTok uh, where you were just talking about um, pronouns and talking about just different like nicknames and things that you liked and that you didn't like. And I remember watching that and thinking, I never would have thought to think about something like that. Like I never would have thought to be like, oh, I don't really like to be called these type of nicknames, but I do like to be called these type of nicknames. Um, specifically with non-binary people, like I, I always knew the terms in they, them, but I never really thought past it. Like, 
oh, I don't really like to be called, I, I forget which ones it was, um, but you were saying about like, I don't like to be called like, maybe it's like honey or sweetie and things like that. I remember being yeah. like, man, like I never thought about that. And now I'm thinking about that for myself, even though like I identify as a female, I, w- I never thought to think like, oh, I don't really like, like to be called those. Yeah. And I think that's something specifically that everyone can think about. I mean, I, it may be that non-binary people and people who are gender non-conforming or identify outside of the spectrum have answers that might be more important to them or bother them more or maybe like surprise people more but ultimately I mean everyone is entitled to have opinions about the language people use for them and I don't think Mm -hmm. you have to um you know like be a specific gender or not gender (laughs) Um, in order to have those opinions and I just like knowing I genuinely made that video so that people would um, like share it and use it so that I could learn about them because I I find it so fascinating hearing how other people feel about their language yeah language is super powerful and there's I don't know like I feel like there's I don't know how to phrase this but but, um (coughs) I feel like language is super powerful and the fact that it it can determine perception, it can make you feel different things, like it it truly is really powerful being able to articulate properly and and um and communicate that. Um when did I know that you said with being non-binary it, it's been pretty new for you. How did you kind of come to terms with with that? Like you you conquered the for the most part like oh I'm gay like you you had gone through that and then and then now you're kind of conquering uh, being you know in the gender queer space and kind of figuring out uh you know being non-binary there how did you kind of get to that point yeah I (laughs) so my coming to terms with being non-binary I find is you know those videos on TikTok where people are like how did I not know I was gay? And then they show pictures of them. Like that is like half of what I feel about my, my coming to terms with the experience, because there are some things that I think of and I'm like, you really, you really thought you were a woman, huh? You you really (laughs) thought that? That's funny. Um, (laughs) And then there's other things that like, much like um, thinking for so long that I had genuine romantic feelings for men. Mm -hmm. Like I, in high school, uh, wore like floral dresses and had long curly hair and like wore bows in my hair. I just, which isn't to say that non-binary people can't dress that way, but it's so different than how I feel and present now that it's um, not all of it is as obvious, but um, I mean, the one thing that I point to as like kind of the beginning of my questioning and also a funny thing that didn't like tip me off is that I, as a freshman in college, started to get chest dysphoria and I had a binder. Like Mm -hmm. I literally had to go to a website for trans men to buy this binder. And still in my brain, I was like, women can have that like which like is true but for me personally I was like it's just I'm just like I'm just like a different type of woman (laughs) (laughs) I'm different (laughs) yeah I'm so different I continued to feel that way for four years (laughs) like I just and I continued to have dysphoria and bind and I I just I think it sort of snowballed from there because the, there are different things that um, are not necessarily easy to identify as dysphoria or feelings of discomfort with your gender and come across in your brain as other things like um, like the term lesbian, for instance. I know a lot of non-binary people identify as lesbians and that's super um, and completely valid, but something that I point to in my life as a clue that I didn't pick up on for a long time is that I have never been comfortable with that word. Like even when I thought that I was a woman who only liked women, 
-hmm. I didn't want anyone to call me a lesbian. I just, it made me so uncomfortable. Um, And once I really started to get into this idea of being non-binary, I was like, that that's probably because it kind of implies that you're a woman. And, um, you know, now that I know more about it, I know that that's not necessarily true, but I think for a lot of young people, um, just like experiencing that word at face value, that's how it comes across. Um, So yeah, I guess in terms of timeline, it was like, dealing with those feelings, kind of having more and more clues like build up. And and to be honest, I didn't really know about the non-binary identity. And I didn't, and I had that first like gut reaction that I'm ashamed to admit now, but I think most people have when they encounter something new, which is just like, oh, that's not real. Like, yeah. <laughs> like that's, you, you can't do that because I remember for uh, like small pockets of time, I did question whether I was a trans man, like binary trans man or not. And so quickly I shut that down. I was like, no, this is not me. It doesn't fit. I don't feel that way. Um, and, And then the first few times that I heard about people who use they, them pronouns, I was just like, that's that's pushing it. Like (laughs) you don't need to do that. Um, which is just silly and sad, but I think a lot of people's initial reactions because they don't know anything about it. Um, and honestly, what changed that for me was my senior year. I, uh, I, there's a play of mine that I wrote that I was producing at my university and I cast, um, this actor who was non-binary and we got really close and I just learned so much more about the identity and, and what it meant. And uh, now we've been dating for a year. <laughs> so Wow, it, congrats. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but they definitely taught me a lot about it and kind of reshaped my idea of what it meant. Um, and I, after a few months of being with them, I, I kind of just forced myself. I remember very vividly, I was like laying in my bed 3 a.m. by myself. I was like, okay, it's time. Like you have to just think about it and you have to consider it and you have to decide. And at that point, I had really reached uh, a moment in my life where hearing people use my old name and use she, her pronouns for me felt very off. Yeah. Uh, it didn't necessarily like bother me, which I think was something that I struggled with for a while because in my mind, I was like, it has to like really hurt me for me to not want to use those things anymore. Um, But ultimately it just, it just didn't feel true. Like it felt, it was like, why'd you say that about me? (laughs) Um, And so then you know, I uh, asked my close group of friends, including my partner, to start testing out they, them pronouns for me. And pretty immediately, I was like, oh, yeah, that that fits. Um, and, uh, and then I would say that graduating and moving uh, to a city was kind of a really good opportunity for me to just like make a fresh start introducing myself with my name and with my pronouns and um it was less of a a asking people to change and more of a just like this is who I am which which made it easier for me and I'm pretty lucky that that timing worked out like that do you think it made it easier when you moved because it was like a clean slate so people didn't know you with other pronouns so when you introduced yourself as they them they were just like oh yeah yeah oh yeah like you know it's Eli yeah I think I mean they them pronouns are still hard to introduce myself with in certain spaces I still get anxious about doing it in professional spaces um particularly with bosses and people who are in a different generation than me because I think that they understand it less and uh and specifically identifying with they them pronouns poses a particular challenge 
that's like not only do you have to correct people on the pronouns that they assume you're going to use you also might have to explain to them what that means mm -hmm. and what it is um and that's just something that takes a lot of energy and stress yeah. so i'm not sure that that aspect was necessarily easier but um definitely deciding to go by a different name before i moved was a really it was like a good little lubricant for me i think mm -hmm. into into my new like quote unquote adult life uh after college <laughs> because i think it is hard to change the name that you call someone especially if you've known them for a long time and that's not to say that you have an excuse not to use their new name but mm -hmm. um it was just nice to have suddenly a community that like wasn't even thinking twice about it because they never knew anything different. So yeah, I was just Eli. I can completely, I, I completely can understand. Um, and you know, I might not be able to empathize completely, but it, it's on a very, not, I wouldn't say minimal, but you know, when you have to come out to everybody, you know, it can cause that kind of anxiety of, oh, like, what are the reactions? How is this going to go? But then taking it a step further and having to, um, you know, kind of, I don't want to say police pronouns, but, you know, do those kind of things like, you know, are they going to say the right pronoun? Do I have to correct them? Do I feel okay correcting them? And that's a, more of a continual thing than coming out. Because all is, yeah, you have to continually come out to new people, but once you do it, you do it. But right. with pronouns, you know, it can be if someone isn't getting it and it's making you uncomfortable, then it's like, okay, like, I, I feel like I would feel like some fear in terms of, of that. And like, do you feel when that happens, like, are you afraid that you're going to be like burdening them by doing it? Are you afraid that like you constantly doing it is like annoying like what are those kind of thoughts i go through your head that make it so exhausting to do absolutely both of those things okay. which i <clears throat> regret having to say because it's not, like something that i would tell other non-binary people over and over and over is that like you're not burdening anyone mm -hmm. and you don't need to feel that way but like the reality is it does feel that way yeah. and largely because a lot of people make you feel that way like mm -hmm. because people don't like to be wrong mm -hmm. and they don't like to um learn new things and change the way that they think which i understand and i i do try to be very patient with people um but i i do find it difficult to correct people about my pronouns i find it less difficult to correct people about my friends' pronouns and my partner's pronouns because that's mm -hmm. sort of less stakes for you, you know? Yeah. Um, but when it comes to mine, I mean, in some professional spaces, like I had a job right before um, quarantine and I was furloughed, but I worked as a receptionist um, at a law firm and it was just a setting where I did not feel like comfortable or emotionally safe correcting anyone about my pronouns so I just didn't and it it sucked yeah. <laughs> it, um it's pretty exhausting to just hear it over and over and know that like that's just kind of the way it is I feel like it could be just so invalidating to all the work that you've done to get to the point of being able to do that and like all of the work, it's almost just like a slap in the face every time and like discrediting all of that stuff that happened. And like, like you said, when you're starting out thinking about sexuality and questioning your gender and thinking that it's all in your head, it just it kind of gets like brought back out of all the shit that you've, you know, like gone through and all the trauma that you've processed. And it's just a little micro, it's almost like a microaggression. I don't know if it is a microaggression, but it feels mm. like it's a microaggression. Yeah, I think that's a good way of describing it. It's, um, I, <laughs> I bought my parents this book to try and help them with my pronouns. It's like a little comic book. It's pretty cheap. They've made it specifically to like give to people who are having trouble with they, them pronouns. Um, it's very cute. And I think one of the the things that that book said is the, the person who wrote it, who is non-binary, um, 
said that like everyone feels differently when you misgender them but personally for me like every time I hear the wrong pronouns for myself it feels like I'm like carrying a backpack and someone adds a brick to it and then I just Mm -hmm. have to carry that around all day and reading that was just so validating for me because I was like that's exactly what it is it just feels like weight that you have to just lug around Mm -hmm. and um and people don't even realize I feel like those bricks are just those projections that people are their their own opinions and their own compulsory heterosexuality that they're forcing upon you and it and I think that's a great representation of like an actual brick it's like an emotional brick of all of this shit that's just getting you know trying to intervene in your life um but what is the comic book called for anyone who's listening who would love to maybe oh yeah yeah. I wish that I knew for sure off the top of my head I think it's something like um a guide to they them pronouns something very simple like that it's a little comic book it costs seven dollars um I I I recommend it it's it's a fun little read and I think that it makes it pretty consumable for people who might be resistant to learning about they them pronouns that's awesome well maybe when we get off the podcast I can put it I'll put it in the description if we can yeah I'll find it and send it to you and that might be able to help people out um but awesome yeah that was great I feel like talk and just talking about the um just that exhaustion of that every day, just trying to fight those little, uh, we'll, we'll keep calling them microaggressions. I feel like it's the mm-hmm. best thing. Those just little things that are like nitpicking at all of the stuff. Um, and I feel like not just with people who are trying to figure out their gender, people trying to figure out their sexuality, but like in other minority groups as well, you know, and I really want to talk about the Black Lives Matter movement because that's something that I feel like people are exhausted. They're they're exhausted at trying to fight oppression, similarly to us in the queer community. Um, And uh, yeah, I would love to talk about um, what's going on with Black Lives Matter. I feel like I can't start a queer podcast and take up space um, with, you know, because I've been doing all of this, you know, some activism and stuff like that and not talk about it. It just, it feels wrong because Black Lives Matter, Black Queer Lives Matter, you know, Black people are part of the queer community. We have gotten the rights that we've gotten because of, you know, queer folks and and trans folks um, that are people of color. And so I think it's a great segue um, Mm. into kind of what's been going on and what we can do as a community to help end white supremacy and get shit done (laughs) in the White House. Hell yeah. Yeah. So, and I know you're all for it. I know that you've been posting things about it too. Um, And so, yeah, let's dive into some of that. I had been following ever since what happened with George Floyd. I remember when I watched the video and I didn't watch it at first. I had seen some things on it and then somebody had posted it. It was a TikToker, I think. And she posted it to Instagram and I felt really, I didn't watch it at first. I felt really weird watching it for a number of reasons. One, because it's trauma porn, but two, it was too uncomfortable. And then I thought about it and I was like, well, why am I so uncomfortable watching this? Why didn't I watch it the first time? Yeah, it makes me uncomfortable because it's something that nobody should be watching. But it's also uncomfortable because I feel like I, in the past, have ignored a lot of things out of white privilege because I didn't have to acknowledge it. I thought I didn't have to acknowledge it. And I thought that being, you know, not racist was enough. You know, Mm -hmm. I never grew up racist. My parents aren't racist. And I thought that that was enough because I didn't, I grew up in a Republican household who they didn't really think that protesters were cool. They thought they were jobless liberals who don't pay taxes and hippies. I actually got called a hippie by my grandpa today. At the pool. Really? Yeah. 
he, cause I had missed, um, my cousin had made dinner last night and we got like a last minute invite and I went to a protest in Cincinnati. It's the first one I'd ever gone to. And I was out at the pool today taking a, like a lunch break and they were all at the pool and there, he was like, there's our little protester. And I was oh like, my God. that's so uncomfortable. Like, oh, come on. And I know he was just joking. I mean, he's almost 80. And sure. grandma was like, yeah, you missed our dinner. And I was like, well, it was last minute. So I already had plans. Yeah. <laughs> like, also and, like not to mention just the vast difference in importance between like dinner and you know systematic system systemic yeah. wow I can't talk systemic racism yeah it's like oh my god and so I literally come out to say hi and and that's that's kind of what I got met with was our our little protester and he goes you're you're a hippie aren't you I was like grandpa I've always been a hippie yeah <laughs> I've, I've literally always been a hippie and I'm pretty sure and he he was like well I grew up in the hippie movement and my and my grandma was like you weren't a hippie, you were a hillbilly. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. And, uh, oh, man. So that's what I got met with. It, it, could, it could have been worse, but it, it definitely could wasn't have been good. Better. <laughs> it could, yeah, and they were like, was it, were you safe? Like, was it violent? And I was like, no, there was, it wasn't violent. It was actually really great. It was the biggest turnout ever. It was on the news. Um, we had one a week prior, and um, this one was... I mean, it was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. Um, but yeah, that was kind of the foray, foray into getting into it because I felt, now I feel so bad because that's kind of how I had grew up. I didn't realize that there was more to be done. I thought that being race, not being racist was it. And I was like, oh, yay, sure. I, I'm not racist. <laughs> That's, that's all you I have it. to do as a white person <laughs> is to not yeah. be racist. Yeah. And there was this perfect thing on, I forget, I know Hannah Hart had a bunch of people have, have shown it, but it was like, you're at the bottom of the hill where it's like, oh, you're not racist. And then the top is like where the actual work is being done and everyone's sitting at the bottom going, oh, shit, like we got here. Oh, I haven't seen that. That that sounds like a really good graphic. <laughs> it is. It's such a good graphic. And it like all of these things have been so have been just very I don't know like eye-opening and educating and I feel like I'm constantly evolving and I don't know where you are on that front and we can talk about that but I just I really wanted to just say that I I felt super embarrassed I felt super ashamed that I hadn't done more and I and it took now after ev like all of the murders, everything that's been happening. And like, I've, I've watched documentaries. I've done all of that. I, and like, I knew about the injustices, but I never took action. Like I was like open mind, all of that, but I never signed petitions. I never donated until now. I never called, you know, local government. Like I never had protested and I had such weird like things and thoughts surrounding protesters because of how I grew up and how they were not looked at favorably and mm. were not looked at as status or elite because they weren't productive enough, you know, sure. adding that in. Um, yeah. And so I just, now I feel like I just felt activated. I don't know if it's because now I'm, you know, I've been out for a few years. I'm part of another minority group that includes people of color and so that's one front but this has been some other things and it just triggered me and I'm so glad that I watched the video it was so uncomfortable but it was the best thing that I could have done and I, I watched it once and that was it and it, and yeah I I don't know like it's it's a constant involvement how are you feeling about it how how did you grow up and, and since George Floyd and everything that's in Breonna Taylor and everybody that people are protesting now, like, how did you grow up with it? And what are your thoughts? How have they evolved now that things are happening in the last few weeks? I feel pretty similar to you. I, I, my family isn't Republican, but they are um, a family that I don't remember really talking about politics growing mm -hmm. up, like, at all. 
Um, I didn't even know which political party they belonged to until like late high school because we just didn't discuss that. Um, and and they are Democrats, but they, um, you know, are still middle-aged white people. <laughs> um, yep. <laughs> and I, so I think having that silence around it really taught me to be silent about it for a long time. And, and that's like, not just on them, that's on me for not going out of my way to research and, um, and like open my eyes to injustices. But I think that I was very similar to you. I was able to just exist in the world without thinking about it because mm -hmm. of my body. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And so I did. And that, um, you know, that's not excusable anymore. I Like it yeah. never should have been. But I think now um, there's sort of a mass awakening, which is... yes amazing it's so horrible that it had to come about this way but it's um i think i feel it feels like worth it not oh my god that's such an awful thing to say not <laughs> worth it um, but i guess like when i'm seeing all of these protests and i'm seeing like people coming out in the masses and thousands of, of people coming together and um so many people who are in situations like i think i was in you're saying it sounds like you were in where you were just sort of complicit and yeah and just existing people are sort of waking up from that um in in the masses and that i think is um what needs to happen long overdue but but i'm glad that it's happening now and I'm hoping I'm still I'm so much still learning like there's still so much that oh, I don't okay. know about and I still need to <clears throat> learn about and and to be honest that's um a big insecurity that I have about like being vocal about it is yeah. not knowing enough about it and um having conversations with people who maybe like I'm trying to change their minds and then I run into a point that I don't know how to defend because I don't know the information and then it just yeah. feels so embarrassing and it's like why are you even doing this but I think that um that just pushes me to learn more and I hope that it's pushing other people to learn more too yeah I completely agree with you on that I I felt <clears throat> um insecure when I started posting about it for a number of reasons one was because I like you said, I didn't feel as educated as I could be, even though I've, I've seen, I've done and seen a lot just for genuine interest, but now it's imperative that you know these things. And I felt the need to acquire all this information so that if things and conversations come up with family members, like I can do my part to, I mean, it's hard to say challenge opinions because nobody likes the, their opinion challenged, but to have the education to be like, um, well, defunding police is not going to, you know, <clears throat> be the end of the world because it'll be better and it'll, the funds will be allocated, you know, X, Y, and Z, all of that stuff. Right. <clears throat> Jeez, I don't know what's in my throat. Um, but I also felt insecure because I didn't see my close friends and family members posting anything. And if they did, it would be like one thing or like it would it was like the trend of putting, you know, the black square, which mm -hmm. had a lot of problems with it in general because it was clogging up because people weren't doing the right hashtag and, and it right. was this, this, and that. And people were saying, delete your square. So I deleted mine. Mm -hmm. And, um, and like they would do that and then like, that's it. And then they would go to back to posting their own shit and it would be more of their own shit than it would be Black Lives Matter stuff, which made me mad. But then I was like, yeah. well, can I be mad? Because I was that person with every single other thing that happened when black people were being murdered. Why am I mad now? Do I have the right to be mad? Um, and I think you kind of need to be mad at this yeah, point. I think so too. It, it, it's also hurtful to be like so up in arms about it and nobody else is. And you're just like, yeah oh my god like how are you not how did you not get to this point like I know that we were all silent before but like now now is the time and and then you have to think well who am I surrounding myself with like 
And, and then there's all of these other things that you think about. Like I started thinking about, you know, you start thinking about when you're older, like your parents are just people and you realize that they're just people yeah. living their own lives with their own trauma and their own upbringings. Right. And I had gotten to that point uh, like a year or two ago. And with this stuff specifically, I had really, really thought hard, long and hard about it because, I mean, my parents aren't anti-racist. They're not, they are not racist, but they're not anti-racist and they're not going to do mm -hmm. those things. And I had to ask myself, you know, why? Like, but I think that they're good people, but they're not doing these things to end white supremacy. And, and it's just like, they're not even like, activating their minds to think why and it's right. it bothers me to my it bothers me to my core yeah. um and I think I that's the you. big part about posting is like oh my god what are I thought like what are my friends gonna think what are like am I gonna get made fun of and then I thought like well why do I give a fuck if I get made fun of like this is the right thing to do and if they're gonna do that which I haven't gotten made fun of but mm -hmm. like like or just judgment like silent judgment if they're sitting I don't know sitting in their homes being like my God, she's posting a lot about Black Lives Matter. And then I thought, well, if somebody's doing that, they're pieces of shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I you know? think that's sort of the, um, that's kind of a realization that you make when you do start to be vocal. It's made me think a lot about um, pride and how much I've benefited from the work of past activists and, mm -hmm. um, and how much I've taken that for granted because I, any time that I, you know, can be comfortable and safe talking about my sexuality in a public space, it's because of them. It and um, the fact that we're not there yet for something that feels like it should have, we should have gotten there so long ago. I, I mean, I had a really similar moment where I, because I was posting things on TikTok and then I was about to start sharing resources um on Instagram and my Instagram I mean I it's much more like the group of people that follows me on Instagram is much more um like people I know in real life and my mm -hmm. family and mm -hmm. um yep and friends and so you know some stuff I didn't think twice about but then uh I remember specifically I was about to share a post about uh ACAB Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is going to make some people really mad. And yep. I, I like paused before posting it. And mm -hmm. I had that moment, that same thing that you're talking about, where yep. I was like, wow, I can't believe that I was about, like, I was thinking twice about this yeah. because I was scared in my white body behind my screen yep. that like, I might make someone uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And it just, uh, it really, um, it was a good learning moment for me, I think, because it forced me to think about it. It forced me to recognize my own problems. Yeah. And um, and it was it also gave me the opportunity to work through it, which I'm really grateful for. Um, not that like sharing a post to Instagram is something to be wildly proud of, but you know, it's a step. It definitely is a step. And it's not people of color's jobs, it's not black people's jobs to educate us it is our problem and our whiteness and we have to fucking fix it it's right. it's not their problem to fix it and that's that's what sucks the fact that people of color they're exhausted because of everything that's going on just the oppression for hundreds of years and the fact that just all of the different factors of systematic racism built on slavery and police that were created to control people of color and the systems of oppression and white supremacy that have just this undertone. And so all of these little things, and I'm going to use microaggressions that people like, you know, talk about like, oh, well, you know, like it's because of black on black crime and looting is the real cause and all of these things and it's completely devaluing all of the heinous shit that's going on and and it's hard because looting is sucks it's bad so when people say that it's like it's if you don't have the education it's kind of hard where you're like well like looting is bad you know but like murdering people is a little bit worse <laughs> yeah it's a lot worse and, and worse. having the language and having the to be able to articulate 
like, hey, why are you phrasing it as, like, why are you prioritizing looting? Are you prioritizing looting because you're prioritizing businesses because you're prioritizing capitalism over human lives and right. all of this stuff? And so, like, it, I, I think that people are finally realizing, white people are finally realizing how exhausting it is. Totally. And, and it's mean, not like an not excuse. Not to the same extent, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's not, yeah, not to the same extent at all, but and it's, and it's no excuse, but I, I want to, you know, end this topic with the fact that, like, if you're a white person, you are, we are the ones that need to fix this, like, because this has been over hundreds of years, and, like, we need to fix white supremacy. Yeah, we do. I mean, it's, you it's gotta not stop wrong. profiting off of it. Yeah. And um, I think that's really a call to action in a way that I think a lot of people have not seen it as for a long time. Um, specifically, I've found like having those conversations, I've had a lot of conversations like with my parents, with other people, um, where you do kind of, you're setting out to change someone's mind. You're not just like in this cycle of agreeing with each other over and over, which is what I find a lot of my friendships are, um, which is, awesome it's really validating to have that support and have all of us band together and be angry um but you know the the more important conversations are ones where you're kind of bringing people over to see see why all of this is so horrible mm -hmm. and um i think those are conversations that i gave myself an out from having because i didn't mm -hmm. have the information and i was like well yeah. i don't really know enough about it so i'm not going to talk about it yeah. and um I think that if you feel that way, um, specifically if you're a white person, just like consider this a call to action because it's it's not an out and it's not an excuse. And mm -hmm. at that point, you just need to educate yourself. And yep. that's what we should all be doing right now. Yep, I completely agree. I think that showing up imperfectly is better than not showing up at all because not showing up at all is silence and silence is what is going to keep systemic racism here and it's going to keep white supremacy here and it can no longer happen we need it, it, it's going to cause violence and it has caused violence yeah so <clears throat> yeah so definitely wanted to address that yeah, um definitely and if worse comes to worse you're leading out a queer apocalypse commune. So if this shit goes totally. south, <laughs> Eli has a plan <laughs> to bring us all into a queer commune in the Alps, right? That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, yup, I wish I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I've just had so much of like so many responses saying like, but it's so cold there. And I was like, you know what? I sure wish I thought of that <laughs> before I just romanticized pine trees <laughs> and wildflowers. But here we are. So tell so me a little bit about this. Um, because you've made a few videos on it. I thought they were fucking hilarious. <laughs> Considering the times, just with the global pandemic, you know, uh, inequality uprising, everything that's going on, and you're like, let's get the fuck out of here. <laughs> let's get the fuck out of <laughs> here. All queer sometimes. people can come, you know, allies, maybe, maybe, right. but A they soft, have to maybe. like show. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it definitely started just like as a funny thought that I had. Um, and then, I don't know, people were just really interested in talking about it. So I just kept answering people's questions. And then it turned into a whole thing, which was very fun for me to make. <laughs> and I, um, I've been enjoying it. The comments were hilarious. They're like, I'm bisexual. Can I come? <laughs> oh, man. Or like, so many of those. <laughs> Like, I'm a straight ally. Can I come? <laughs> I, and I, you know, the thing that really gets me, which, like, maybe it's on me for not making it clearer, or maybe it's just the way that TikTok works, where, like, you can't see the previous videos just because yeah. you're watching the one, but, like, mm -hmm. so many people, I think, 
really think it's happening like really think that I'm doing this <laughs> and so they they're so serious about it and I I don't mean to make anyone feel dumb for that because I get how it happens but just from my perspective it was so funny to see people like DMing me being like I can't do it your video but can you make a google form for me to fill out to apply <laughs> and I was like I <laughs> we're not moving to the Alps but like I sure wish <laughs> like they got their U-Hauls packed. Like they're ready to go. Like oh, they yeah. got their <laughs> their girlfriend Stephanie. They're like, Steph, pack off the U-Haul. Like we're going <laughs> to the Alps. <laughs> People are ready. The they've cats. got their plants. They've got their cats. They're and you know what surprised me more? I was astounded by how many people came through in the comments and were like, I already know how to take care of goats. Let's do this. I was like, Why I can do milk you the goats. We can make cheese. Of goats? <laughs> like. <laughs> Just is this like a skill that gay people have that I just missed out on that I, I didn't know we were supposed to learn at gay camp to like how to take care of goats. But a lot of people know how. Oh, the middle America gays are coming out of the woodwork. They're like, I know how to work with farm animals. I was in 4-H. Listen, <laughs> you know how to go to the barn through. and pick up the shit from all the horses. <laughs> like we can do like they're all like, we can do this. I like, love it. I love it. And also, like, I, I made that video where people could duet and, like, show their skills. And I've just seen so many cool things that people can do. And they're like, well, maybe this will be useful. I was like, how do you know how to, like, twist metal into sculptures? What? That's it's amazing. It's so cool. Queer people are so cool. We all know how to do such cool shit. I know. <laughs> And I feel like, like this, like if there's some really cool, like straight ally men, like they can be the breeders, right? Like we only need like maybe like five or like sure. 10 of the strongest ones. I prefer ones. if they were bi, but like, uh, who yes. do you? Yes, you know? that would be great. Um, A lot of people came through asking like, like I'm bi, but my partner is straight. Can he come? And I was like, yes, don't be dumb. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we have created a system where like if, if you're straight, you have to first go through an obstacle course and then uh, prove yourself by baking all of us bread and jam. So I think that's the consensus. And we'll bread and jam. Yeah. There we go. I just like when people give me warm bread to eat. So that's, that's where that came from. <laughs> I'm, I'm that's pretty amazing. simple. <laughs> that's all it takes is some hot bread and some jam so if you can can jam you're ready to go yeah that's hilarious um so I did also see that somebody actually made artwork for it too like they made artwork of you yeah. in the middle and then they had the alps on the side it was so good it's a movement. I was astounded yeah, they messaged me on Instagram and was like, and it was pretty early on too, like before a lot of people were looking at it. So I was just, I, uh, my mind was blown. They were like, I hope you don't mind. I made art about this. And I was like, mind? Do I mind? This is so cool. And it was so well done and like had all of the things that I had talked about in the video. Oh, incredible talent. <laughs> and that's when you realize you're like, oh man, people are taking this seriously. I was like, I gotta I'm gonna be up. remembered for this. I I feel like I've become like a cult leader <laughs> and I'm gonna lead all these people <laughs> to their like terrible demise. <laughs> the queer cult. <laughs> instead of, of drinking our, oh, keep going. <laughs> I was just gonna say, like, instead of our um, mutual demise, we'll all just like hang out and be friends and that will be the end of our story. <laughs> Not as like it's a little it's anticlimactic, but it's a little more realistic, you know. Especially for gay shit. people. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought that was the funniest thing ever. Um, but man, okay. So I do want to take this time to talk about our sponsor. I'm just kidding. We don't have as any sponsors. Um, oh, I was, I was about to take that so seriously. I was like, go for it. This is we don't have any sponsors, oh but if you're listening and you're a queer business or know of any queer business owners who would like to sponsor us, you please. hand over just bags of cash yes. like in Monopoly. Just... Yeah. Bags of money. If you want to be a Robin Hood, you know, yeah, up to you. But yeah, hit me up in the DMs. 
if you're a business or no business at Brie Logan. Um, and I also wanted to say, if you guys are loving this episode and getting value out of it, please drop us a review on iTunes. This helps us get discovered by more queer listeners just like you so we can get in the ears of people who are looking for some cool, relatable, queer content. Um, and if you don't know where to find it, if you scroll on the main page of the podcast on iTunes, of this podcast, you can see um, where it says tap to rate with the stars next to it. Um, and then after you fill in the stars, Below that, in the bottom left corner, it'll say write a review with like a little paper pen graphic thing. Um, and again, if you're loving this, um, those reviews are very much appreciated. Um, so with that being said, we have another segment called Questions from the Queers. So this is a part of the podcast where we try to answer your questions on life, love, happiness, et cetera, that um, we probably have no business trying to answer, <laughs> but severely underqualified. Yeah, that, <laughs> we're not therapists. Um, Eli and I aren't therapists, and I probably none of the guests that I'm going to have on this podcast are. If they are, that that'll be amazing. Um, <laughs> but we do want to help you guys out if you have any questions. Um, and so, yeah, if you'd like to submit a question that could be chosen for another episode, please send them to questions at queertalkpodcast.com. You can put your age and your city. Um, we love to see where you guys are from. Um, but if you want to stay anonymous, please let me know when you submit it so that I can keep your identity private. Um, but yeah, without further ado, uh, today's question comes from um, somebody who wants to remain anonymous. It's going to be pretty short today, but I think this is a really hilarious question um, that uh, Eli got in their DMs. Um, so uh, this person wrote, if you could get any piercing, regardless of any pain or risk of infection, what would it be and why? <laughs> I know this one so well because I genuinely do really want to get this piercing, but I am so terrified of pain. Yeah. I really I want an know. industrial piercing. Ooh, okay. Really yeah. I, I can see it. I don't have a good reason other than that I think it looks badass and I really like asymmetrical piercings like ones that are on only one side of your body um so that's that's it but I I literally like have tried to hype myself up enough to get it by watching a video of someone getting it so that I could be like this is how painful it's gonna be and then I saw the video and I was like, you can't do that, <laughs> you coward. So we're still, we're still trying to um, muster the courage, but check back in a year, maybe. It's basically like two cartilage piercings because they, they come in like here, right? And then they yeah. go in a second time. Do you have and one? I can't see. I don't. I just have a tattoo. So this is oh, just cool. a little tattoo. Um, and I got the tattoo because I had a cartilage piercing back in high school and it never quite healed. Like there was always a little bump and it would get infected all the time. Mm -hmm. And with sports, I always had to take it out anyways. And okay. so I stopped wearing earrings for a long time and just started wearing earrings because I got some dangly ones because I wanted to be like all the other TikTokers. For and sure. I got a little dangly cross. That's why we do anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I got this tattoo when I was uh, in another country because I wanted something up top, but I didn't want to go through the maintenance of getting another infected like cartilage piercing. Yeah. And so this was something that was like a little tiny, I love but, that. but yeah, that's great. Yeah. I've never had a cartilage piercing, so I don't, I've heard that they're pretty painful. I know a lot of people who have the industrial that like it took so long to heal. I'm just terrified. I'm truly a coward. <laughs> I know it takes a long time to heal more so than like a regular cartilage piercing, but like mm -hmm. cartilages take forever just because of where they're at. And yeah. like, I just couldn't get on board with it. Um, I'm just super low I just, maintenance. I so to... I just got a tattoo. <laughs> I, hey, I mean, I support that. <laughs> um, I just need, you know, additions to my appearance to let people know in case they were confused by looking at me. Yeah. that I am in fact a homosexual <laughs> like <you>? I did <laughs> I I think it's um truly the peak of comedy when people don't assume that I'm gay 
when they like assume that I am straight. Uh -huh. uh, that to me, it nothing can ever be funnier than that <laughs> because I just like. You look like a cottagecore gay, like you do, like in your in your Instagram and your TikTok. I was like, oh, they're a cottagecore gay for sure. Really, I actually have never gotten that before. Well, I, I like I saw like with the mood and like you have like the you know you talk about having like fancy stationery i think you wrote your i'm pretty sure you wrote your uh some of your tiktok fans letters and you put the little <laughs> stamps on them and like i was that's like oh true. shit that's true <laughs> i just i i think that cottagecore is something that i am just learning about so in my mind like i couldn't have possibly been because i didn't know what it was yeah but i would that's pretty accurate i just I love paper. <laughs> it's an interesting thing to love. Yeah, but I, I mean, it kind of makes sense. That's like, I'm a writer. I True. Playwright. Yeah. That's what I'm doing with my life. So. I get it. Yeah. I get it. I get it. Well, hey. Um, we are going to end this out with lightning round. So this is going to be a segment guys where I'm going to ask Eli some rapid fire questions and they have to answer really quick. So it's going to be one of those things where like first thought comes to your mind, you have to say it because I'm going to go super fast. I hate um, when people know my first thoughts. <laughs> are you ready? I as ready as I'll ever be. Okay, let's get into it. Question number one, texting or talking? Talking. Dog or cat? Dog. Big spoon or little spoon? Little spoon. Are you the gay that squishes the bugs? Regrettably, like not by choice, but <laughs> I'll do it. I'll okay. step up. <laughs> Best movie to watch for a queer person? Oh, uh... Damn, that's hard. <laughs> I suddenly like can't think of any movies I've seen recently. I'll probably edit it out to make it look like you did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I this isn't a movie, but it's a TV show. Is that okay? Oh yeah, that's fine. Um, I just finished rewatching Shit's Creek with my family, and just the way that they're their representation gets like slid in to that show mm -hmm. um have you seen it I have not but I've heard good things okay. about it it's just it's um I think very powerful in that they don't make their queer character political they don't make anyone in the universe of the show homophobic so it's like mm -hmm. honestly one of the first times I've seen a queer person on screen just being in love and like being happy and not having to deal with like uh tragedy porn so yeah um I I think everyone should watch that show it's also awesome. very funny was it like one of those things where they were just queer and it and that was it like it wasn't like their whole story revolved around being queer and coming out and like having a deal they were just like they were just a queer character totally and That's also awesome. I think even better that he um was bisexual so I feel like bisexual people are never on screen at they least aren't. not in like a normal way mm -hmm. um and he just like had a really great storyline of like being with a woman and then you know a few episodes later he met a guy and I don't want to give it away but like <laughs> yeah it's um yeah very much like I, I watched it and I was like oh is this how straight people feel watching literally every other type of media <laughs> being represented <laughs> It must feel good. <laughs> yeah, what's yeah. it like? Awesome. I will definitely check out Shit's Creek. Um, okay, we have a few more. Uh, Doc Martens or Birkenstocks? Doc Martens. Hey. Last <laughs> song you listen to on repeat? Rabbit Will Run by Iron and Wine. Nice. I love Iron and Wine. I Really? Oh, they're my favorite. Oh, I love it. I'm uh, trying to learn that song on guitar, so I've been listening to it over ooh, and over and over. That's neat. That's awesome. Um, giving presents or getting presents? giving presents that's something I'm really into awesome and then uh last two first celebrity you had a crush on 
Kira Knightley. <laughs> <laughs> and the last one, um, a little bit more involved, but if you could invite anyone to dinner, living or dead, who would it be and why? Mm, what a good question. Uh, Oscar Wilde, probably. Ooh. He's just, uh -huh. you know, like he did it all. He is, first of all, a playwright, and I love that about him. He's Irish, and I am also pretty feckin' Irish. Can I say that on your podcast? Yes. You oh, yeah. That. I've been casting this whole time. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, he had the most impeccable queer fashion sense even though it was the 1800s, just like out dressing like a refined queer gentleman would love. Um, <laughs> and he, he was so smart and so witty and um, I would just love to pick his brain. Also, he uh, essentially died because of his sexuality, which is just- Really? Yeah. Did he, not um, know that. He was put in prison for it because someone found out that he had a relationship with a man and he didn't die in prison, but he died from like a disease that he caught in prison. I'm hoping that's correct information. Someone might come at me if I'm wrong, but um, okay. I, I think I remember reading that and I just think, I don't know, that just makes me very sad and also um, grateful to him for being one of the people that had to go through that. That sounds like an amazing experience if you would have him for dinner. You know, we'll chat, we'll gab, he'll give me fashion advice. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready for Oscar Wilde to come in and change my freaking world. Yes. <laughs> and maybe he can tell me like how to get a play produced because still working on that. <laughs> some professional advice, some personal advice. Yeah. Honestly, we'll be want. best friends by the end of it. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, Eli, thank you so much for being on this podcast. Um, if you want to check out more about um, Eli Campbell, you can find them on TikTok on Eli underscore Photog, P-H-O-T-O-G, and E.C. Photog on Instagram. Um, and as always, you can find me on all platforms at Brie Logan, B-R-I-E-H Logan. Um, if you guys enjoyed this episode, please drop us a rating on iTunes and leave us a little written review. This helps us get discovered by more queer people just like you. Um, that's it for this episode, my queers. Um, just want to let you guys know, be you, be queer, stay safe, and we will see you on the next episode.